session, next session, ECMO session. We are moderators, Dr. Popov and uh, Dr. Uh, Antonistis. Yes, in first presentation, uh, microcirculation during ECMO support. Uh, Do Dr. Aiken. Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, give a summary about our experience uh, in microcirculatory monitoring during ECMO. Um, I have no disclosures, but I know Jan. Janis is the inventor of uh, microcirculation all over the world, and he invented also uh, work together to improve the third generation uh, handheld camera. I'm a cardiologist. I love microcirculation and ECMO and other mechanical circulatory support devices. And I'm a fan of echocardiography, so they call me all, as well imaging intensivist. Our uh, brilliant team of cardiac surgeons, cardiac anesthetists, and perfusions, they are working every day on performing good operations in uh, heart with normal heart-lung machines, but I, we are the only hospital in the Netherlands using MIEC. So that was, um, for me, uh, as well, uh, um, very surprising. But it's um, by these brilliant perfusionists, uh, I went the uh, last uh, two weeks to OR to experience by myself. Uh, because there's a lot of uh, comparable uh, similarity to ECMO, and I'm ECMO director of our center, uh, especially to the VA ECMO. We are performing 80% of our conditions VA ECMO in our hospital and 20% VV ECMO because of a lot of eCPR as well in our uh, region. Coming to the bedside, physiology is very important in those patients who are suffering uh, um, and who are uh, critically ill and um, they have uh, a form of shock in many times in cardiogenic shock and we have to manage, measure properly the uh, uh, tissue perfusion. And there's a lot of development last years in microcirculatory monitoring. We are using this device, instant dark field imaging by Cytochem and this is the third generation. It gives 30% more vessel density and uh, more uh, red blood cell detection. What you are seeing is, is one millimeter square of sublingual area. Imagine that there's uh, vessels with uh, less than 20 micrometers with slowly flowing bl black dots are showing the red blood cells. And now we are working on improving more this device into OxyChem. I will tell more about OxyChem later on. But uh, recently, they described a uh, useful area, sublingual area between the frenulum of the tongue and sublingual area, the triangle, which is very good to compare after each measurement, to compare your intervention. So with the heterogeneity of the capillaries and the venules to make a good decision about how, what to do when it is uh, altered. And, but it's not very easy in the OR. I, can, I suffer there two weeks to measure some patients with MIEC, cabbage with MIEC and cabbage with wolf with MIEC. And you see here the uh, minimal invasive cardiopulmonary bypass, and there's not much more place left to someone who can put the device in the sublingual area. So it's not very uh, easy, and that's why um, I, had, I did my PhD in the ICU. It's much easier and in the outpatient clinic to measure sublingual area, the microcirculation. The previous study mentioned before by Eurek showed by Sidestream Darkfield that there is a, a benefit from using MIEC uh, compared to conventional uh, extracorporeal circulation, which gives me less uh, acute kidney injury, higher hematocrits, and higher microcirculatory vessel density, what we see here. And that's why I am very interested to compare it as well with ECMO. And we, we, we did uh, a lot of measurements in ECMO during sporting of the ECMO, implantation of ECMO, and in particular, very important, when you go off, when you are weaning from ECMO, that's very important. And when you measure with this cytochem one millimeter, uh, one millimeter square area, be aware that any tiny uh, alteration can be important. We do it by green light, so the third generation, third generation device, instant dark field, compared with the side stream dark field, the previous, the second generation is more, uh, uh, much better in, uh, in, in showing more vessels, 30% more vessels. These were the patients I measured last time in OR, preoperatively in the department, in the cardiac surgery department, we show just a healthy uh, patient with uh, three vessel disease, good uh, left ventricle function, and 
we saw the slowly flowing the red blood cells. But during the cabbage on MIEC, you see the very high velocity of the red blood cells going on and some of leukocytes even showing them between the capillaries and the venules. And after the post operative measurement I did when they were came from the OR with uh, full sedated, with, uh, with a tube intubated and um, just uh, sedated, fully sedated and fully uh, controlled, ventilated. And so that the microcirculation was not recovered in totally yet. Compared with the other patient who was going for the article valve replacement, I measured in the preoperative state, there was no um, alterations, no uh, fills with no flow in the uh, capillaries or venules. During the extracorporeal circulation, you see that there are sluggish and stopped capillaries. It's very obvious in eyeballing even that the con conventional extracorporeal circulation gives more alterations in uh, sublingual microcirculation. And postoperatively, we saw, sorry, postoperatively is very interesting, surprisingly, even that maybe there is a factor of a good ICU that there is a recovering microcirculation in all uh, fields. The total vessel density was not differing. So there is something in between extracorporeal circulation and the ICU stay or some to the, uh, the way to the normal ward that is coming well. I don't know what, but we have to discuss about it. One case from my ECMO patients is this 44 years patient who uh, recently got an orthopedic surgery of the left knee, knee and she went home and there she uh, unfortunately got a cardiac arrest by pulmonary embolism. She woke up with dyspnea the next day after the operation and called the ambulance. Um, and at the ambulance arrival, cardiac arrest was detected with a pulseless air, uh, electrical activity. When in the Netherlands, the patient is reanimated in uh, at home or in street 50 minutes, then the medical uh, team can arrive there. When the patient is below 50 years, there is a trial going on on scene by helicopter. You go there with the medical team and you can implant ECMO in the living room of the patient. So they did in this woman, and they had a flow of ECMO after 30 minutes of the start of the cardiac cardiopulmonary resuscitation. This was the CT scan, pulmonary embolism, and we showed that, and we put her in the ICU with TTM ECMO just implanted already at home. So the Schwangas were inserted for properly hemodynamic monitoring, and then iloprost and milrinone were started for the right ventricle uh, supporting the, uh, the with these inotropics. And we perform daily echocardiography in these patients. The question is when to go off? When are we going to properly wean from this um, ECMO? And while the flow is three to four liters, and we, 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 we fight with some uh, complications like hematoma in the groan, of the leg, leg cannula dislocation, replacement of again, and meanwhile, daily assessment of the weaning, if it is possible or not, because in these patients we we getting from the street with ECPR, we see pulsatility in day one, very fast. Pulsatility, when you have pulsatility on your monitor, you can try a weaning of echo. Echo is the guideline at this moment, or the golden parameter for weaning off from ECMO. What we are in our center very experienced in microcirculation, so we are doing microcirculation beside. Because the cardiologist is using echo and want to measure VTI of the left ventricle, can't say anything about the right ventricle function. This is a very uh, gray area for the cardiologist. So you need something more for monitoring the hemodynamics, actually the tissue perfusion, than the echo. This echo shows right ventricle, which very widened. And the left ventricle, you can't say nothing about the function of the left ventricle. So the next day, again, echo, the left ventricle starts to contract up, but the feelings, everyone can say it's not enough. The, uh, the stroke volume will not enough. So we making every day a transthoracic echo, parasternal long axis, parasternal short axis, and we still see a white right ventricle. And we try every day to uh, decrease the flow of the ECMO and see what happens with the right ventricle. It's going to contract till less and less or being akinetic or getting over, taking over the circulation and help left ventricle to feel better. But we didn't see that in these patients day after day, day after day. 
And at the end, we did T T O E. So that's the that's the end of the echoes. We end always with the transesophageal echo if we can say something about the transesophageal echo. And we there show that the right ventricle was okay, was slinking after decreasing the flow to half liter ECMO flow. Then even we couldn't make a decision. But at the end, we measure the microcirculation to see whether the echo imaging can help us to, to complete, together with the microcirculation, that there is definitely a tissue perfusion with this echo uh, cardiac function, what is the only um, function, functioning pump, but by uh, ECMO flow of half liter per minute. So we see here totally recovered total vessel density of the capillaries and the vessels and still hyper for flow and hyper flow of the red blood cells even ECMO flow is half liter per minute so after five days you get a lot of inflammation in these patients so we explained the um, ECMO after five days by using microcirculation to complete the image so she got post genetic encephalopathy and the tube didn't score for it was uh, present. We gave her tracheostomy on day eight. And eight days later, she went, she went off from the ventilator. And she discharged to normal what after 16 days. Why I'm saying this is because we did a couple of years ago a uh, study with 10 patients. We did in all these patients during the ECMO weaning one single spot shot of two minutes holding the camera in one place. While Wouter de Wilde, my colleague in Zurich now, or Ben, Ben, the uh, pervisionist, he was decreasing the flow of the ECMO to half liter. And I was just holding the camera in one single spot. And this was showed with four liter and with one, a half liter. What's happening in the microcirculation? If there is no change in microcirculation, that's a proof of cardiac recovery. In these patients, we showed a couple of years ago. So that's why we are using now in our clinic, especially by the pulmonary embolism patients with the left side, that echo is worthless. That's why we are using this because the end organ perfusion is the end, your direct, the goal of your therapy is end organ perfusion. So you can have like this, when you are decreasing the flow, that there is no flow any left in the microcirculation. But in this patient's couple of years, we didn't do daily echocardiography. And then you get surprised when the echo full thrombus meets you. So we don't have this anymore because we are doing daily microcirculation and daily echocardiography. And that's why John always says, yeah, you have to couple the microcirculation to the microcirculation to have a coherence. So if you have the last patient with noradrenaline, dobutamine, you have versatility on your monitor, you have a low lactate, and you think, I'm happy, then you check the microcirculation, it's totally worthless. It's stopping when you decrease the ECMO flow. It's all ECMO flow where you are treating that. And, and go further and make a transesophageal echo, and you will, met, um, you will see the complications what you had uh, oversee all the days. So physiologic assessment of patients in shock, especially in mechanical circulatory support with temporary or long-term devices, you have to look from different sides to these patients to have a good picture, the complete picture for uh, the best options for the patients and the best steps to go further to, to recover from uh, cardiogenic shock. So from thermodilution measurements to urine output, echocardiography, microcirculation, that makes it complete. I think there is a place, therefore, for OxyCam, which is measuring with two lights, not only green light, bl blue light is, has been proven to make more vessels visible and more erythrocytes visible and the leukocytes to show even with, a, uh, with the algorithm the DO2 and the VO2 in the microcirculation. That's the next step, and it's, it's now going on to uh, a prototype is developed and is now going on to make more uh, clinics uh, interested in to uh, share share some studies with them to make uh, with this new device with two kind of two uh, two types of green green and blue light to uh, monitor the microcirculation more uh, properly 
and more physiologically to measure even the DO2 and the VO2 in the capillaries and the venules by just by capillary hematocrit and red blood cell velocity, very easy in a capillary, uh, capillary uh, and the venule uh, 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 site of the microcirculation. So in summary, in conclusion, we can say that monitoring the microcirculation in ECMO can save lives in selected patients, especially in my opinion, every ECMO patient, and especially pulmonary embolism patients. And in terms of organization family with advanced hemodynamic monitoring, it's possible. Daily measuring of the microcirculation could prevent complications in mechanical circuit support. MIAG is promising in the oil for more complex surgery, but it's a tough yeah, technical, uh, technical challenge to make the make the films make the pictures image and every critical patient can benefit from daily microcircular monitoring and especially when oxycom device is ready for clinical use i think we make one step further in the clinical use of microcirculation thank you very much for your attention okay thank you for your impressive results and a lot of uh, let's say food for thought and uh, further clinical development so I think that we can move instantly to Justina Swall. Justina Swall is online.